reading today is First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twelve through twenty-four. You can be found on page nine fifty-eight in your Q Bibles. Final instructions. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one but he pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our psalm today is Psalm 126 on page 501. I will... Uh, speak the odds, if you would please read Psalm of the Evens. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like the, those who dreamed. Our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongues were sung to joy. Then we said by the nations, the Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. And those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Praise be to God. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. Continuing in verse 19. Now this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize, I, I baptize you with water, John replied. But among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Now 
Now our reading this morning from our from our solo series that I've been reading each week <laughs> goes like this. God puts people in our lives to prepare us for Christ. Their job is to till the soil of our hearts to prepare us to receive the seed of the word. John the Baptist was called to prepare the people for the coming Lord. Many heard his message and repented. But many others resisted and turned away from John's witness, therefore, therefore by rejecting the coming Christ. Will we listen to the call and receive him, or will we turn away? Grace and peace and joy from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now in our gospel, talk about John the Baptist. He was someone who knew while he was here, wasn't he? He was some of all those people that knew. He was here to tell us of the coming Messiah. And as our reading from Saul had just said, many heard the message and repented. But others resisted and turned away from John's witness, thereby rejecting the coming of Christ. It still happens today, doesn't it? We reject the words of those who know. And the question is, is why do we do it so easily? We have to ask ourselves, is it because we don't care what they know? Or is it maybe some pride in our, in our souls that we don't want to be told something by someone else? Or is it just a lack of trust that seems to be getting very rapid in our society. Now I'm sure it's all a little little piece of all these why we don't like to listen in the long run. And too many times we feel we need to find out for ourselves, don't we? We've got to reinvent the wheel when it's already there. But when you get right down to it, the point of faith is that we listen and trust in what we're told. Of course, we have to go to someone who we know is true, like Jesus Christ. For his teachings have never been found false. And God the Father, who he got his Jesus got his teachings from, well, he's been around forever. So we pretty well know he knows. But it's still difficult sometimes. I mean, look at Adam and Eve. They were the first to not trust God's words, weren't they? Yeah. They knew nothing else until Satan came along in that snake. So we must realize that we too will always be tested. Like our reading from 1 Thessalonians say, we have to test all the things that we're told and realize what is good. No, we have to decide whether we give God the lead or entrust in Him everything we do or go with our own plan or maybe the plan of the world. It's, a, it's actually a learned art to listen to good advice and to the experience of those that came before us. And I say it's a learned art because our sinful body is always take us the other way. So we have to learn. You know, it's just like the nativity story as I was telling my second year confirmation group. Though it gets tweaked a little bit here and there, sometimes it gets shortened, sometimes it gets lengthened. It's still the same story. It has survived for over 2,000 years. The true theme of the story of the birth of Jesus Christ will never be lost. If we continue to listen to those who know and believe. And then we spread it to our offspring. We tell it to our kids. We tell it to our families. We tell it to those out there in the world that don't know. The thing that we always have to fight against, though, is the false prophets. And we know there's a lot of them out there telling lies. I mean, you look at the reason for Christmas. It's been diluted into gift giving and, and parties. So we have to be stern and straight and faithful in our, in our words. 
We can't lose the proven truths of our Bible. That's why that book is so solid. It too has never been proven wrong by honest people. And I add honest people there because there are deceivers trying to disprove it every day. They use dishonest ways to try to say, oh, the Bible's just a book, it's nothing. But the truth is, it's never been proven false. So we can trust it. We can look to it. We can read it and understand that God had his hand in it. Because like I said, God's been around forever. He knows what's going on. And he wanted people like you and I to know the real truth. That's why he had those men write it down. That's why he had inspired people to write down the stories. And that's why I said John the Baptist. Because if you look at our gospel, the Pharisees were questioning him and trying to put him on the spot. False teachers were getting way out of hand. So he said, John, to tell the people the real truth that the Messiah was coming. The Messiah was coming to the world to set the record straight, to tell the truth for everyone to know. Jesus not only was on the way, he was actually there. So a short learning moment. Do you know why John the Baptist was named John? I spoke this in our Bible study the other night, so some here have heard it. But the reason is so important, I want to repeat it. See, it was against human tradition to name your child just some, some name. In Jewish custom, the firstborn would be named after someone in the family who had passed away. Think about our families. My middle name is Richard. That was from my, my great grandpa, Richard Pryor. It was to keep the name and the memory of the ancestor alive. So it still goes on today. We don't always really understand it. But you think about how many kids' middle names or their first names are a member of the family. And when we say and we think about that family member, like I said, when I say Richard Breyer, Scott Richard, I think of Richard Breyer. He's on my office wall. Never knew him, but he was a tough old bird. So it's, it's amazing. And then you go a little deeper, and every Hebrew name had a traditional meaning attached to it. So this is how it was done. There was no questions asked. Families followed the tradition. But Zechariah didn't have anyone in his family named John. So how could he say that John was John? People question him. Why are you naming that? There's nobody in your family named John. Well, it was simple. Zechariah had heard what God had told him. In a dream, God told Zechariah that he would name her son John. And Zechariah was going to do what God wanted. Because he was following the one who knew. And the part that I love is the Hebrew traditional description of the word John, of the name John. It translates to God is gracious. I just think that's so cool. Because it's, it's the truth. I mean, you think about it, Zechariah and Elizabeth. God was giving them their firstborn well after the appointed time for her to have children. God proved he was gracious. He gave them that first son. And then you look at the people around them. The Hebrew people knew what John meant in their language. So when John was baptizing people, it was a man named God is gracious. Did you ever think of it that way? Think how huge that thought is. These people were coming to this man. We call John, but to them it was God is gracious. So they were coming in to be baptized, be forgiven of their sin. Because God is gracious. It makes the story so much bigger than just 
these people go into this guy in the river. In their head, they knew that was God doing that for them because God is gracious. No. It was just another point in the part that these people had listened to their people before them. That said there would be a Messiah coming. There would be somebody coming. So here he was. Again, they listened to the people that knew. And here was a man named God is gracious baptizing in the river. How could you how could you not just melt right there? But that's how it all ties together. When we have an open heart, an open mind, and we listen to the people that tell us the stories that are true, then we too will be looking for the signs. We'll be looking for the future coming. And we'll always be ready for that day. When we listen to the words of our Advent, we'll be ready for the joy of the second coming of the Lord, the Advent of Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, when you read that story, these people are ancient, the ancient Jews were looking for that Advent, that joy. No, you listen to the people that know. I mean, as I say, you take our, our Advent read. Our words of the Advent season that we've had so far this year. I didn't make them up. They were passed down from those that know. Remember the first week? The shortest candle here? That was hope. Again, hope is not a wish. But a promise. We don't hope for things. We know Jesus Christ is coming back to make things perfect. We don't hope for Jesus. Because we know he's real. And he is hope. Next we have peace. Not a peace about not just fighting. But a peace that calms our soul. A peace that we feel in the world. <laughs> Even in times of trial, we have peace because we know in the end Jesus will take us home into his eternity. And we know that because of people before us. And now today we have joy. <coughs> the accumulation of what we realize so far, we know the hope of the peace of Jesus. And now we have joy knowing that we're part of this. Again, you see how it always comes together? I talk about that a lot, how the Bible comes together and it all fits. And it's up to us to teach our kids that we were told by our parents and they were told by their parents and you keep going back. That Christ is coming back. That we can have hope, we can have peace, and this week we have joy. Now, next week we will we'll see the love of God in that last candle. Because that's what ties it all together, the love of God. And then the middle candle, the Christ candle, where God shows us that love in his son. It's not hard to figure out. We don't have to try to reinvent it or try to study it to the point we don't understand it. God says, I've told you all this stuff so you don't have to worry. I've sent my son to tell you again, don't worry. I sent my son to get you prepared and get you practicing because when he comes back, he's going to need a good team, a good group of people to follow. 
And I said before, the reason he hasn't come back is that we have a lot of work to do out there. We've got a whole bunch of people to get taught and shown and explained to about what we know because of what we were told. Ah, it's good stuff. Don't let anything in the world worry you because Jesus got it covered. He showed us once before and he can do it again. Ah, I tell you what, let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, the joy of knowing that you can conquer any sin, any evil, anything in this world should give us more joy and more freedom than anything we understand. When we share that peace, it's because we know what we were told. Now give us courage and, and the will and the desire to go out and tell others about what we know. Then we'll all find the the peace and the joy and the hope that you have planned for us. Ah, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for being our, our Messiah. Thank you for giving us time to, to teach those on the road which way to go. Ah, oh, Lord, we just pray this all in your, your holy, holy name. And we thank you for being our God. Amen. Amen.